Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. Wow, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with everyone. My name is Stefan Kaplan, and I am the founder and creator of the Spin It Social Hour. I am a social media visual strategist that has been working on this show for 38 well, yeah, 38 weeks now, 38 shows, must be 38 weeks. Uh, actually, this is number 39. And the Spin It Social Hour is a labor of love born out of care and concern for our photo community. I started this show because when the pandemic hit, I realized that I needed to give back and I needed to help our photo community because everybody was getting hit hard by the economic fallout of this pandemic. It has been a long road for all of us. It's been a very, very difficult road, especially also for photographers. Jobs have been canceled left and right. Many have been turned to do many different things. And I must say, um, so many of them are doing such incredible work that it does my heart good to be able to bring them on. Uh, we had this show on Saturdays for a while, but it is now every other Thursday at 9 p.m. Here we are. And it is a pleasure to be in prime time, I must tell you. I am thrilled. Um, you know, out of 39 shows, well, this is the 39th, out of 38 shows, I have to tell you, we've had some incredible work shown here, some amazing stories told. And I know that, um, you know, it's just been an incredible journey together uh, because I consider it a journey with the photo community. So... Tonight, we're going to bring on Edward Leskin, who's a great photographer out of uh, Pennsylvania, who has been working on a great project for a while. He's one of the big fans of this show. Um, but first, I just wanted to say it's it's been an amazing experience bringing together all of my multimedia skills. Um, I've worked with the likes of the Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, for three to four years doing live social media for them. I was a photo editor at the New York Times for over 15 years, and I've dived deep. I'm going to date myself a bit here into my Rolodex, and I've made sure that I've brought my digital Rolodex, that is, and I've made sure to bring, you know, so many talented people to uh, you every week. So um, I thank you for your time. I thank you for being loyal fans of this show. And um, I am going to now give Edward the buildup that he deserves. I have put together something really special, as I do every every other week now, um, for the photographers, uh, based on the work that I've uh, you know curated from all of their hard work. And let's do it for Edward the same way. Here we go. Enjoy this. We all see in color every day, says Edward A. Leskin, photographer and Spin It Social Hour's most loyal viewer and commenter. How we see things in the mind before we present them, and with black and white, there's less distraction. With color, we have all these tones and hues and everything. In black and white, what seems more graph uh, that, with black in black and white that seems more graphic to me, and it is much more efficient in portraying emotion, form, even abstraction, and very powerful. While Edward carried a double major of fine arts and political science at Moravian College, his concentration was photography at the Pratt Institute, from which he graduated with an MFA. After 20-odd years in the family business, Edward became a full-time photographer. His most iconic image may be of a man at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund has used again and again in its promotions and materials. It was such an honor to have to put my name on everything, Edward notes. However, the project that draws him back again and again is documenting the people and the history of Bethlehem Steel. Edward's photographs of the old plant and his portraits of the steel workers who were employed by Bethlehem were included in the exhibition, The Steel Way of Life. His work is also part of the collections of the Historic Bethlehem Partnership, the National Museum of Industrial History, and the Steelworker Archives, Inc. Currently, he is preparing a book of his photographs of Bethlehem Steel and its workers. Among his other projects are documenting the politics and social conditions in Russia, Israel, and Palestine, bringing together his two passions of photography and political science. Folks, it is an absolute pleasure to bring on one of the big supporters of this show. Please welcome Edward Luskin. I'm uh, honored, Stefan. Thank you. I mean, I couldn't. I mean, that's absolutely beautiful. Your uh, introduction. I, I'm speechless. It's thank you, thank you. Well, I'm going to take a drink of water real quick after reading <laughs> that. 
That was uh, quite the bio and build up. Um, and I have to tell you, you deserve every bit of it because you are really dedicated to the craft. Um, I am, um, I'm always thrilled to meet somebody such as yourself, who is a purist and who's so dedicated to uh, classically trained, number one, um, so into the art uh, and not has not succumbed, uh, even such as myself in many ways, because being in social media to the social digital whole thing, you stick true to form. And I'm going to really look forward to showing all of your work. But first off, please tell us, how have you been doing during the pandemic? Well, you know, like everybody else, you know, we're in a whole new world, you know, uh, with everything being shut down. Um, you know, I feel like I'm on a different planet. And yeah. you know, I, I so want to get back to the way things were. You know, we were discussing this the other day, uh, the slices of pizza that I like to get in New York, you know. and That's I mean, right. There's just so many, so many things about, I want to see people's smiles again. You know, I mean, yeah. with everybody with the mask and everything, it, it really, it, it's like, it's like a bad science fiction movie. So hopefully we're, you know, we're going to get out of this and uh, yeah. we'll discover our humanity again. Yeah, no, I know it's been tough. It's been tough. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's even tougher is in terms of, you know, we've we've all been cocooned so to speak for what 10 months now yeah. and it's just tough hearing the news every day you know it's tough hearing the news every day um i've taken news fast i'm sure you have as well um because it it's it really takes its toll on the senses after a while and uh one of the things that you know is really important is to is to make sure that we continue to move forward. You know, we, we can't let everything dismantle everything that's being done in society. We have to move forward while the scientists and while the doctors and while everybody else try to get this thing under control, you know, and we owe so much to all of our first response, uh, frontline health workers and everything else. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about something else. Um, interestingly enough, is your work that has in many ways, the economy, a lot of things that have taken place over the years has taken its toll on an industry that has meant so much to this country uh, because it's, 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 it's helped build half of this country uh, in many ways. So tell us, tell us how you got started in photography, first of all, and then lead us into your passion for documenting uh, Bethlehem Steel, and then we'll start showing some of the work. Well, my interest in photography go way back. And even, even my father uh, used to shoot Polaroid all the time. And, uh, you know, I was fascinated by, by the technology about how that worked. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, you know, I played around with it here and there. And I remember I mean, maybe about 1980, my mother went into the hospital and I was real upset. And my father uh, asked my mom, um, you know, your your son is so upset. What does he want? He says he wants a camera. So my father uh, bought me my first SLR, and I started to experiment with it. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, and, you know, at that time I was going, you know, I transitioned into high school, and it basically collected a lot of dust in, until, uh, until I uh, really my last year of college. That's when I discovered the magic of the darkroom. Uh, when we see that first image appear from the chemicals, I was like, wow. I know. It's magical, you know, and, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, what the thing is, like my second printing session, uh, I started seeing an image and then it turned yellow. I, there's something I didn't do right in the darkroom. I said, I think I'm going to be lousy at this. <laughs> um well, you certainly, you certainly are not lousy, Edward. You are anything, anything, but a total, but a total pro. <laughs> and the thing about uh, my talking about Bethlehem Steel, um, that's something I've I've heard about my entire life. I was born in 1965, and my my father uh, came to this area uh, in, as part of this uh, computer company that uh, that uh, that they were going to sell uh, um, equipment to. Mm -hmm. And he was the branch manager, and uh, it was called the company's name was Frieden. And uh, one of the primary customers was Bethlehem Steel. And I remember uh, hearing over the dinner table, like he would say, you know, um, 
they just showed me a new piece of equipment at, at the plant. You know, they were so proud of it that they, they wanted to show my father everything uh, that was happening there because, uh, you know, everybody was connected. And, you know, this is a way of life. Um, it, the people don't realize that an industry like this, it wasn't just about the people that worked there. It was everything that was around it. Um, all that business uh, supported uh, many different things in the community, and even the community itself benefited from it. So when it mm-hmm. when it finally uh, closed up uh, in the mid nineteen nineties uh, with the last cast, and finally the, the, the demise of Bethlehem Steel itself, later, uh, you know, it was like something had died. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was a really a strong hit, and that's something that we see throughout the country. I mean, how many times have we heard this story? Right. Um, and, you know, in a, in a place like this, you know, oh, we talked about this. Uh, and when I first heard about it, I was absolutely amazed. 80% of the skyline in New York City was built with steel that came from specifically the the, the Bethlehem plant. Wow. So, um I always we were just we were discussing this with my friend that's going to come on uh, Bruce mm-hmm. Ward. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking if he didn't really know what he was doing, that some of that steel might have might have hit you one day in New York. You know, thank God they knew what they were doing, and and boy, it, it's still standing. It's really a it's really a I mean, tribute to uh, the men and women that uh, that helped build this country, if not the world. It, it really is. It really is. You know, I'm a born and bred New Yorker. I was born and raised in New York in Greenwich Village. And, you know, I we were just talking about this the other day. Um, mm-hmm. And two things we were talking about, you and I, we we're having some great discussions. Uh, you know, you're amazing to talk to. You're so knowledgeable about all this stuff and have so much history in your head um, that. You know, I I worked at the New York Times, like I said, for years, and um, a couple of our photographers there did a lot of work on some of the steel workers uh, Mm -hmm. many times. Fred Conrad did portraits of them. Chang Lee, uh, another great photographer, did a lot of work, uh, you know, used to go up on some of the structures with the steel workers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's two things. One is I grew up looking at the Twin Towers, you know, sadly enough. Uh, Yeah, you know, and I grew up actually going down there, bike riding near them, skateboarding near them as a kid with my friends. And then we were talking about the segue into after the just devastating uh, time of 9-11. Yeah, it's... Um, and and the point that I'm getting to is that then we hit on the point that could you imagine the feeling of of the guys that worked on putting up the trade center, seeing that number one mm-hmm. and number two, then rebuilding it and showing the strength and the fortitude and everything else to be able to rebuild and and make this city what it what it once was again and to then be the guys who tip it off, top it off at the top. What a feeling that must have been. Talk about this because you've been around these workers. So I'm going to let you now, please, please tell us about that, about their, about their passion for what they did over the years. Well, you know, the funny thing, the thing about it is, is that, you know, it's not uncommon from what you would hear with people that served in the military and, and, and fought in wars, you know, um, they had they had a camaraderie. They would actually think of themselves as brothers and sisters, and you know it involved not only uh, everything that was on the job, but outside, you know, like the whole social structure of everything that occurred uh, in in the community. You know, I mean, well, what do you do after work? I mean, you establish a lot of relationships, and, and these people were very very close to each other, and. Right. Now, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact about, about how dangerous it was mm. uh, to produce steel. You know, it was right. really, a, a, at times, it was a terrifying thing. Um, one of the gentlemen that I uh, that I uh, photographed uh, and I participated in interviewing, Richie Check, um, all his brothers and sisters worked at the at the, uh, at the plant, you know, if you added up all their, uh, the amount of years that they all worked there, it was over 400 years mm-hmm. of contribution. Uh, and 400. yeah, you can't even wrap your mind around that. No. 
but he 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 told this story and and uh, my friend Bruce Ward and I we we were interviewing him and mm-hmm. uh, you know Bruce is very good because you know he he was an actual steel worker he added a little added some things that I that I could mm-hmm. uh, and you know, Richie started talking about uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the of the, of the blast furnace. Uh, there was an accident and they had to, you know, they sent some people down to find out what was going on and they didn't mm. come out. And then they really? sent more people down and they didn't come out and then oh. more people down and they didn't come out, you know, I and mean, just the way that he told it, it was, it was haunting. And, and, you know, you, you, you think about what, what all of those sacrifices. Well, um, yeah. I, I, I remember a story uh, you know, when I was photographing, uh, Part of this, uh, when I was going to Pratt Institute, uh, mm-hmm. all this started. Um, I remember hearing a story of a gentleman who uh, he was hit with water, mm-hmm. and, and and his head uh, was, blew up to the size of a pillow, and, and there, there was nothing anybody could have done for him. And uh, you know, every once in a while, we would, if I would walk by the area, you would hear an ambulance, and you knew where it was going. Mm-hmm. You know? It's just your heart just sunk. I said, what happened now? Mm. You know? Well, that's the thing, working your industrial plants or anything else. You know, unfortunately, there are going to be these incidents when yes. things happen. And you know that when you hear sirens, that it's not good, of course. Each, you know, their lives are in each other's hands. You know, if somebody yeah. messes up, that, 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 that yeah. could yeah, and uh, well, we've seen that we've seen that all around the world. I mean, when we've had incidents with uh, miners, uh, it, whether it's here, Brazil, wherever, uh, you know, anything where things can, these trophies, those miners were trapped for how many days in a row underneath, uh, I forget which country it was. Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but you know, mm-hmm. it's an incredible, incredible job and feat and very courageous job that many of these guys did over the years. But what I, you said the word haunting, uh, as I put this photo up oddly enough when i was going through your body of work and what you've put together the images are striking but they're also haunting so tell us about how you approached photographing the remains of bethlehem steel that i'm going to go through here well i mean that the first picture that you have up there that's actually those are actually the cement couple cement kilns um uh, they're very old uh, they were let's see i have a note here they were from 1892 to 18, 1893, they were built. And it was wow. decommissioned in, in 1904. Right, because I have this photo right here. There was So the, the inscription here is 1891. Yep. yep. So, um, you know, it, it was um, contributed uh, by the cement company to, like, as a museum. Uh, right. It's like 72% of all the Portland cement in the country came from, our, from the area of this plant. Uh, wow. In 1900. Wow. Um, now, the photo that I showed at the beginning, Edward, this one here yeah. is so unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us about this. And also, I mean, when was this? Because the plant is no longer functioning, correct? So when was this yeah. taken? Uh, that was taken in 1989. 1989. Okay. And, yeah. how did this, and how did this come about? Because it's an absolutely striking photo. Certainly was part of my thesis work at Pratt Institute. Um, and... You know, when you first see something like this, this goes back a long time. How many times I've gone by there and, and you would look at that flame. Uh, it would actually would have a bluish hue to it. It, it was really hmm. something. Hmm. Um, and, you know, when I, w- I remember being at Moravian College at the art studios, which weren't, weren't that far from there, maybe about right. uh, two miles, you would constantly hear the noises of, of this thing as if it was alive. It was a beast. And... Uh, Finally, you know, when I got to the, uh, when I became proficient in the darkroom and, and I started developing film and, and I applied those skills to graduate school, um, I, uh, I got that, that very same camera that my, my dad bought me in 1980 I used uh, for this shot. And I believe I used Tri-X for it. And, uh, you know, it, it's part of that um, process that um, Ansel Adams always talked about, pre-visualization. Mm-hmm. See, mm-hmm. 
what time of day would I want to go out there? Well, that's obviously, right. I want to wait until the sun goes down and I want to get that glow. And that's what I waited for. And it was cold. It, it, it was around this time of year. Um, and I walked down to the edge of the um, river, set up the tripod and, uh, you know, did timed exposures mm-hmm. and developed the film. And I had mm-hmm. a, I had a really wonderful image. Um, well, that's the, that's the interesting thing, you know, is that, we're in the digital age now, and there are some really high-end digital cameras that take some right. unbelievable photos. Yes. But you can tell when you've shot film. And this photo here. here here's you know, an interesting thing about this image, though, now. Don't tell um, me it's digital. <laughs> no, but what I helped, the digital helped a little bit. <laughs> what happened is, I uh, because it was a roll of film, you know, we all have various focal lengths that we use. Sure. Um, the, uh, the initial shot was taken with a 24-millimeter lens. And I had a, I also had a 50 millimeter lens with me. So there were a couple of frames here, a couple of frames there, and, and they were always separate prints. So what I wanted to do is I said, you know, if I were, if I were to look at this now, how would I shoot? I would try to shoot it in medium and large format. And, uh, you know, you can't go back in time. So what I did is I layered in the 50 millimeter shot, which was composes all the details mm. Uh, in in the center of the frame where, where you could see the blast furnace and everything, and then as I as I worked it out, I had to redo every pixel. It was like okay, the hours at work. Well, you know, post processing and doing stuff in in uh, Lightroom and all these other programs today are is so amazing to learn how to work. Uh, I'm going to invite on in the near future. Uh, someone uh, great. Uh, he's probably going to hear about it for the first time right here because I probably haven't even told him. The nice thing is about this is I was reimagining it. You know, we, we, how many times have we gone back into our negatives and we right. say, something? I can bring something out of this that I didn't think about before. And it's no, like, you you can you can bring out so much. Uh, Andrew Cavanaugh is his name. He's a, an amazing Photoshop expert. And uh, anyway, so this proves it. I yeah. mean, you you put some work into this, but it's a beautiful image, regardless of it. The actual image is intact and it speaks true to form. And, and of course, you know, old film, other things, this and that, you work on it and you come up with, with this beautiful finished image here. And you know? when, I, when I shot it, the sounds that came from that place, it sounded like somebody was getting punched in the gut. You could right. hear uh, all the gases uh, erupting and the, uh, the, the things like metal being slammed down and and cut and all my you, you when we talk about that danger uh, that, right. that that we're told i mean it, it's like i'm over here and it's over there it's like god right well you know you've done so much work i just want to start going through more of it here i mean um the i love your I, i'm all about angles when i do my work and i have to tell you you are I, some of these the angles are just phenomenal the contrast, uh, the black and white is just gorgeous. The contrast is, you know, the clouds over this structure that is just, it's, wow, so historic. It's so that, power. It's so powerful. That was taken recently, you know, within the last few months. Sure. You know, sure. Um, we may have influenced each other. You tell me to keep looking up. <laughs> it's like, we, uh, oh, oh, well, that's, that's, that's very flattering. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's very flattering of you. That's what I used. And, uh, and of course, these are remnants of, uh, of the structures that exist on the, on the plant site. Uh, right. That, this particular shot I, I took in 1999. Mm. And you can see uh, the, 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 there was a company that was hired out to do all the uh, dis- uh, demolition. The name was Brandenburg. And uh, you can see in the in the distance that very structure that I took a photograph of. On the, uh, looking up, you can see the arches of it right there mm-hmm. uh, beyond the horizon. And a lot of the people that were hired to do the demolition worked at Bethlehem Steel. So this particular gentleman was just looking out at it, what – what is going to become of all this? You know, I, I was thinking right. of the shadows and, um, you know, it looks kind of desolate, you know, and, and it looks like Roman um, ruins. Yeah, it does. And, you know, it's the way he's standing there with that with that um, stick or something rod in his hand and looking out at that perfect angle, but yet silhouetted by this structure that 
it's so the you know the geometrical shape you know it's just so it's just so perfect uh this is you know a classic i mean all of your work belongs in a museum uh it's it's american history man i mean it's it's amazing and um you know but i want to get to a point here um as we roll through these photos um because i know about you you know we've talked and uh you're a wanderer and uh signs don't <laughs> signs don't always deter you do they oh no, they do not they certainly do not you know <laughs> I, when I took that picture, I was like, you know, the funny thing is where, where, I, where I took that from. I mean, you could walk right into the, the joint. You know, it, it is, some people have actually done that. Uh, uh, my approach was a little bit different. You know? Okay. I had, uh, I had a friend uh, at the time. She was going to FIT of all places. And oh. one, of, one of her friends, um, this is when I was at Pratt. And okay. one of her friends was going to Moravian College. And he also worked at Bethlehem Steel. Okay. And, and I talked to him. I said, you know, I, there's something I absolutely have to have as part of my body of work. I got to get in there. I have to get into the plant. You know, I know I'm not allowed in. Mm -hmm. I said, sure, I'll, uh, we'll work it out. So uh, one day we, uh, we, uh, you know, we did some prep work talking about it. You know, he says, you got to dress the part. And, you know, of course, I, you know, I had, um, I had like a fatigue jacket, jeans, T-shirt. You know, I had work boots. You know, I uh, I uh, I don't even think I shaved that morning. You know, I wanted a little uh, little uh, um, razor stubble. You know, and uh, when we got in there, you know, it was like the the first thing he told me before before we got into the plant. Mm -hmm. See. It's okay when you, you know, look normal when you walk in, but when you leave, look like you're upset. Right. Look the, look the, look, look the part, as they say, right? Don't ask any questions if you look like you, if you, if you look up mad or right. distraught. Um, and maybe that's the thing about being, maybe it's a, a lot of it was physically demanding. You know, you have, mm. you have to think about oh, yeah. being tired. Yeah. Um, I couldn't imagine the the. I'm sorry, but I'm 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 tough in certain ways. But working in a plant like that over the years, mm -hmm. that ta that takes its toll. That's hard. That is that is the hardest labor around. Man. It is certainly. I I love this particular shot. Amazes me. Um, I uh, it was very low light, and uh, I believe the camera I used at the time was a Minolta XE7. It was like mm -hmm. a joint camera that was produced by Leica and. In Minolta, and it was a 35 f 1.7, and we need, I used a, a film called the Neopan Fuji 1600, and it really, uh, you know, we uh, for that kind of a thing, I really had to up the ISOs because of, right. of that environment. I want to make sure that we got all the shadow detail and everything. Right. Really, even to this day, I'm amazed at the at the resolution and sharpness. Oh. If you look at this, the first thing that my eye goes towards are two things. One. Is first of all uh, the the wheels on yes. on the uh, what are those called by the way? <laughs> those are on top of them. Those are that's where they cast the metal ingots. Those are called ingot molds. Okay, so and, you, you look at the wheels, and then the next thing that attracts me, of course, is the wonderful angle that you got them at uh, because the molds are basically in such a row. And then you have the spotlights on top of them, which yep. sort of bring your eye down that whole row, straight down to the end. It's just a, you're, you have a really wonderful eye, and, and uh, you're you're a uh, you're a classically master trained photographer. What I uh, the thing is, I didn't have that much time to do it because you know because we were sneaking in. You know, if you pull your camera at the wrong time, right? You're toast. Right. <laughs> so, um, I remember. Uh, one of the comments that was interesting about this, if you look at the, um, if you look at the top of the, and I didn't, that particular picture, I, I didn't take that's part. No, of I know. I wanted to show the con. I'm sorry to do that to you. I wanted that's to show quickly the contrast between a historic photo that somebody that you got this for the show and then to show yours. So this is Edwards. And then take a look at this folks. Yep. I mean, here is the same, um, these these same um sorry again the uh the molds uh yeah. that uh, look at look at them i mean and this is a close up of the wheels in there and then look at edwards i mean just perfection both in both photos and the yeah. thing about them is and it, i i've been told this before if you look at the statues at easter island mm -hmm. oh yeah at, now look at the top of those doesn't it look like a nose it has that 
Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? Wow, that is really fascinating. That's so true. We always draw these things in. Like this makes me think of this. This makes me think of this. It's what a what a great visual that is. It's true. It looks like the uh, the stones on Easter Island. It does. That, that is fascinating. But wow, what I think they are? You know, it's like it's like you start right. they relate to each other. Well, let's move on to to the 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 other part of this that fascinated me was that the height and the power, the power, the sheer power of looking at these structures from a certain angle. And as my always say, just look up. I would, I would go nuts over here just looking up all day because I'd be, I'd be there for days. I have a feeling um, that you're going to be there with your camera. <laughs> oh, well, I'm definitely when this pandemic is under control, we're going for a walk, you and I, <laughs> but look at this, man. I mean, uh, the structure is just incredible, man. And so incredibly captured. Uh, let's roll through a few of these. So we don't, um, so we don't miss any. And um, now talk to us about the difference between shooting this structure and then going, which you don't do a lot of, but you do some of, uh, and, you know, a fair amount of color. What is the difference? What attracts you to one or the other? Well, you know, I think the other one, you know, I mean, because of the extreme angle and everything, the graphic content, I thought that the black and white was obviously the choice. Right. You know, I, I mean, it becomes, it's almost like a, it's an abstraction. You know, we, we think in terms of shapes right. and forms and tones. And, right. and uh, I don't think, uh, I, I don't think it would have appeared in, if it, if it was in color, I don't think, I don't think it would have had the same impact. Right. At all. Um, but yet, but yet when I get to this photo, yeah. Edward, I, I look at it and the first thing that attracts me the black and white has its unbelievable qualities, of course. Yes. I'm a huge fan of black and white. Yep. But um, I wish I was shooting it again. But this, what attracts me right away is the rust. You yeah. you just don't get that in the black and white, you know? No, and, you know, the funny thing is I was thinking about, uh, of, of all things, I was thinking about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, I was thinking about, like, because you look at the colors, you know, and right. everything. So, yeah, you know, it really, if you took all that away, it really wouldn't, it really wouldn't really do it justice. And, you know, over time, as, as these things age, I mean, the amount of color that you see, um, you know, um, there, there have been many uh, photographs taken in this, and people have done close-ups of it with, uh, um, you know, um, just the colors, and you won't even, you wouldn't even have known what it was. It could be an abstraction. Um but yet you get to, you know, some more black and white. And once again, the, it's the sheer power of the structure. Yes. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the magnitude. I mean, this, thing, this plant is humongous. You know, it reminds, uh, pardon me for saying this, I, it's, you know, it's, it reminds me of something almost out of a science fiction movie in this frame. <laughs> and if you think about the kind of technologies uh, that are in that thing, you know, you know all the valves and, and systems that had the work right. right to prevent the, you know, the, the maintenance of it, you know, it, 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 it is to some, it would be science fiction. Right. And, uh, I mean, look at, look at this. It's something out of a, out of a, you know, out of a movie. I mean, you, the angles that you took this at the close that you got so close in nature uh, to, to the structures. This is a, this is a really, really fascinating photograph. You know, I, when I was thinking about it, when, when I look at that, I it may have been in my mind, I was thinking about Escher's work. Okay, <laughs> and and the one with the stairs and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because, it, it, the minute I look at this, I I, I saw a telescope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, me, it looks like a it looks like a leg being held up uh, with with a crutch, you know, or a, or or support. It, it was, I'm just thinking about that pipe. What would happen if that structure wasn't there? It, 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 anything underneath it wouldn't stand a chance, you know. And so, but that's how this thing is constructed, and. If you talk to people even today, um, a lot of the like like the small railings and fittings that you see there, those are pretty fragile. But like the thick pipes, the major structures there, they're they're not going anywhere. It's oh. Very very thick grade steel on there. Um, so let me ask you this, because the first thing that comes to mind as we're talking about this yeah. is the plant is there's no plans um, to dismantle it yet, right? No, no, no. Actually, it's so, part of the historical makeup of the area. Um, good, this, good. It was transferred. It was 
the furnaces themselves are, are controlled by Sands. They were controlled by Sands Casino, and of course, that's under new ownership now. Okay. Over, over Wind Creek. Um, so, uh, but you know, I mean, the idea is, I mean, a lot of places they chose to knock these things down, and you know, for our history here, you know, that would that would be like, you know. And in, in a strange sense, you know, you think about the Holocaust and you think about the importance of Auschwitz. Right. And I'm not saying that this is Auschwitz, no, but, no, no, no. you know, it has a history. And, you know, you think about the movie The Shining. It, it, when something shines, it has it has a history that's that, that it could be good and it, and it could be bad. You know, we think of, about the times before they had unions. Right. Uh, there was a lot of strife and, and a lot of uh, um, a lot of problems with safety, and you know, once that came into being, of course, of course, that had a substantial impact on the quality of, of life of the people that worked there in, in a positive way. Uh, that image that you're showing right now that was along the Hoover Mason trestle, and it's a uh, it's a little kitchenette, um, and it, it's frozen in time. It's the way it exists today. Right. Well, you know, the thing, the thing, the thing, this is such a ghostly image, you know, because it makes you think instantly of the humanity of the, of the blood, sweat and tears is the only way I can put it. That was put into every day at this plant. And to see this haunting ghostly image of a boot with the, uh, the little oven there on top of the other oven, um, you know, uh, it's and the little uh, the glass there and the dust what's left you know the stories need to be told and that's what's so important about the work that you've done is that we can't let this ever be forgotten no. i mean you know while this is uh there and collecting dust and other things remember here as i go through these next photos that the life of people that lived near the plant that lived and worked in the plant I mean, look at this photo. I love this photo because you see the structures in the background from the plant. You have the American flag in the foreground and you have the classic structures of where people lived in front of the structures of the plant. Talk to us about documenting some of the life that I'm going to show here around the plant. Well, you know, uh, that was one of the first things. We can go back to that image with the flag. Um, That's the one thing I wanted to start with. Uh, I wanted to start with the uh, memorials with death. And uh, I remember when I, uh, back in graduate school, I remembered when I uh, first started with that series, uh, my thesis professor, Phil Perkis, uh, looked at the work and said, you've got to keep going back there. I said, I had a feeling that I was going to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And like this particular image, I was walking on the same soil that Walker Evans walked on. Yeah. We all remember his iconic shot in in this very cemetery. And, you know, I, I didn't, include this shot i don't actually i don't know what happened to the exact negative it was kind of an experiment but you know at one time i set up a camera in front of a certain tombstone and i took the picture and then i saw walker evans exactly in the same mm-hmm. position that i was mm-hmm. and i actually I, i've never saw his picture it wasn't anything that was telling me well i'm going to do what walker evans did mm-hmm. the place kind of drew you right to the location right and some places are like that. And, I mean, well, that that's the thing, you know. You and I, and photographers who have done this for years, are you know we see things in a certain way, and it just sort of it's like a magnet. It yeah. it it pulls you right towards it. Um, the minute you see it, you know, you start positioning yourself, you start you know figuring out the light and the composition. And and many times or certain other things will just fall into place. Yes. For example, if you were on the street and this wonderful little girl all of a sudden just ends up in the picture with the freight cars going by, uh, the cargo cars, uh, that is, uh, that carried probably, what, coal and other things? Yes. So this is, you know, this picture speaks volumes about the life around the plant, about the people who lived in the area. And and then this photo, this photo struck me as just so. Let's face it, man. I mean, let's be realistic here. It, it it's a tough life in certain ways for a lot of people who worked around these plants and who lived around these plants, right? 
Yeah, it certainly was. I remember when I first produced that image. That was actually done when I was in graduate school. And mm-hmm. my, my, my thesis professor ran, took, took the print and ran down the hall with it. Mm-hmm. it hit that heart. Wow. And, wow. And yeah, it was, I was, it was an honor. Uh, and, uh, I, I remember when I was taking the picture, you know, I started when we when we take photographs, if we really want to get into our subjects, it's good to generate a discussion like the obvious leader say, what are you doing here? And I, right. I, I told them I'm documenting uh, um, the Bethlehem Steel in the, in, in the community. And we started talking about uh, what's going to happen. I said, you know, what do you think is going to what's the future of this? And, right. And, and um, he, this gentleman was drinking a beer. He says, I'm not sure if this is going to be forever. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, she, it, and when she and then she she clutches her her chest, you know, it's that feeling of uncertainty. This is this right. is the future. And, and, right. and well, it was the sun was going down. Yeah, I mean, the sun's going down. He's looking down. He's holding his beer. She's clutching her chest. Yes. You know, it's on a on a on a street with not a lot of pedestrian traffic if any at all. Yeah. Um what a what an incredible incredible like photo to have in the collection of what you've captured. But the other thing that you've done is you've captured some amazing portraits. Now, before we show these, I just wanted to show a quick little clip and then we're going to bring on your friend Bruce because he's been waiting patiently after a day of rehab on his knee. And as a former steel worker, we're going to give him the respect that he deserves and bring him on now. But let me just show this. Uh, let me just show this clip. So let me um, let me go to the um, thing here. Let me, let me stop chat and let me go to the file I have ready for everybody and show them this magnificent clip that CBS News did. I'm going to mute myself actually. The steel mill in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, has been shut down for a decade. You look at it now, it you can't believe it. But Richie Check, who spent more than 40 years working here, still can't get used to the silence. No whistles, no horns, no nothing. It makes you cry. Check is 80 years old now. His father worked in the plant, and so did his nine brothers and sisters. It was a place where 32,000 men and women made the steel for ammunition, aircraft, and battleships during both world wars. The Golden Gate <laughs> Bridge, the George Washington Bridge, 80% of the buildings that make up the New York City skyline, they were all built with Bethlehem steel. Hmm. Takes your breath away. Wow. I mean, that is just, you know, that is just amazing. Amazing. Um, I have to tell you that that clip was just what we needed uh, to really add that in that tremendous impact of, you know, seeing Mr. Check there. Um, you know, it makes you tear up almost uh, because, you know, he gave his life to serve the country and help build it. Look at what it built. Talk to us some more about that, Edward. Well, you know, everything that you see, I mean, if you obviously, you know, going going through New York City, I mean, you, you look at the, the Chrysler building, you look at the, uh, uh, the you know, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. I right. mean, you can go on and on and on. And you all remember the iconic photo from from the Depression era of all the steel workers sitting on the beam. I mean, how many That's right. have we seen that? That's right. Uh, uh, you know, it, and the thing that really amazed me, uh, when you talk to the people that that work there, they look for marks on the beam and would tell you where it came from. And they were so proud. If it was a Bethlehem steel beam, and it was a sense of pride, and say, you know, I, I, I was part of that. You know. Right. Well, let's let's have let's have let's have I'm going to give you two the spotlight here and I'm going to move you around so you two can have the spotlight because you deserve it. And you doing all that great work. And let's talk and introduce Bruce Ward. Bruce, nice to see you, Bruce. How are you, Stefan? It's fabulous to be here. Uh, Pain, all pain aside, we're we're doing really well. And uh, I'm excited to be here with uh, 
with Ed. And, well, you're uh, a real yeah. you're a real trooper, and we appreciate you being here because not only you're a former steel worker that also documented a lot of the plant. We'll show some of your photos in just a few minutes uh, to include in this uh, presentation tonight and this show. Uh, historical account uh, by all uh, by all things. Um, is that you had rehab today on your knee and here you are helping us out by coming, show, uh, showing up and uh, being a part of this, uh, this history here. So thank you. And, uh, you know, Edward, how did you guys meet? How did you guys work together for a few minutes? And tell us, tell us about your relationship there. I'll start off with that. Um, we, um, I was involved with a theater production uh, that was a joint project between Cornerstone Theater in Los Angeles and, uh, and uh, Touchstone Theater. Um, and the title of the, the production was called Steelbound. And this was documented uh, by uh, CBS Sunday Morning. They had a whole segment of it. Mm-hmm. And um, basically, uh, it was a production that, that wanted to um, remember the past, but show the community, hey, you know, we can't forget the past, but we have to move ahead into the future. And the lead character uh, um, played by uh, Bill George of, uh, of Touchstone Theater. He, uh, he was Prometheus, uh, and he was this iconic figure that was uh, chained up on, on top of this ladle. And the whole thing uh, was a struggle about how, how, to, how to come to grips with your past and to move ahead on the future. Mm-hmm. And he finally finds out at the end of the play that the chains were created by himself, and, and he had to free himself. To, to move forward. Um, but during that um, production, I started doing portraits uh, of, the, of the people that uh, worked at Steel. The, there were actual steel workers that, that were performing in the play. And the play had occurred in 1999. And it wasn't that many years after uh, they, they were working. So as they appeared then, it's pretty close to what they would look like um, when they would, uh, you know, um, you know, when they were working there. Um, this image, this image, um, this is Deutsch that, you, that you're showing right now. If you look at the flag and all these people coming out, that's the main uh, entrance to the plant game. Right. And uh, that was during a dedication ceremony uh, um, when they were unveiling a, a war memorial that was actually constructed by the, lovingly constructed by the steelworkers. And uh, at the time, this is 1989, I, uh, I just happened to bring my camera in. I was like jogging of all things with my camera, taking it. And I saw all these steel workers, and they were coming out with flags. I saw them like, God, I got the shot. And I, I was just all over oh, it. Well, you, you nailed this picture. I mean, um, you know, he's standing there picking up his belt a little. And I didn't and... Know who the gentleman was. Now, it was yeah. only um, it, Getting back to like uh, this theater production, I wanted to find out. Uh, like, I wanted to get more into uh, the people that that worked there. I started doing these portraits. I started asking questions, and the art director at Touchstone Theater uh, suggested that I talk to Bruce Ward, who who uh, worked there for many years, and, and he was involved with uh, videotaping and interviewing steelworkers. Like, I was interested in getting more material, and I needed to make some friends. And boy, we. We became really, really good friends. Um, the, the guy with the flag, if you go back to that, um, I, we, I was able to meet him years later, and, and Bruce and I had a chance to interview him. And he was, a, in addition to being a steel worker, he was a professional boxer. Now, now, Bruce, you can say a couple things. Bruce, why don't you, you know, why don't you tell us about this? Because you know, I look at this guy, and I'm sorry, but he's he, bigger than I'm life. I'm going to say one thing. No, I think the first thing I think, and maybe it's just me because I grew up, you know, with an Italian grandfather, but he looks like Jake Lamato almost. <laughs> and he, uh, he is from that era, indeed. And uh, uh, Jack was a, a prize fighter. And uh, look at those hands, man. <laughs> it's, uh, it's he had a record. He had a record of. Uh, uh, 20 and five with 17 knockouts. Uh, he had uh, sparred with uh, uh, Larry Holmes, uh, wow. uh, Ali, Chuck Wepner. Wow. He had a fight with Wepner, in fact. And uh, uh, Wepner was known at the time as the Bayonne Bleeder, and they had to stop this fight <laughs> on a cut. <laughs> what yeah. a name! What a name! The Bayonne Bleeder. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Jack was—he was one hell of a guy. 
You know, you can and just you can there just was not a nicer person on the face of this earth. He, he was looks he looks like guy. he looks like a sweet he looks tough as nails in the left and sweet as, as I'm sorry for saying it this way, but I'm just gonna say what comes to mind. Tough as nails on the left and sweet as pie on the right. He probably he probably knocked me out for saying that. <laughs> Well, you know, you had to you had to be careful around Jack because he had all this power. I mean, he was a very powerful man. Look at him, man. I mean, you could just tell, man, that this guy, you know, he he lived that work, but he was also a prize fighter, and he was a tough and, uh, a tough Steve, cookie. A tough time about that, right? What did they do to him in the in the locker room? What did they? Do? Oh, uh, he, see, uh, well, I, I'm not going to tell you that one. I will tell you though okay. that anytime, anytime that. Uh, Anybody bumped into him or was giving him a slight of any kind, he would just go, "Hey." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd 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 walk away if I was somebody else. Well, <laughs> yeah. let's let's go through some of these other portraits here because we want to get through the rest of the work. So, um, you know, you just let's let's give just a look at these faces. Look at this. I mean, this I had to combo these together. This was the perfect combo, in my opinion. I hope you like it. I thought that the two workers here together were just, you know, side by side. Uh, just absolutely striking. Um, what a, what a contrast um, in in the look, yeah, um, you know, between the two of them. Uh, very serious, a little more mellow on the right, but yet he has the Bethlehem T-shirt underneath. Uh, I don't know what you call the uh, the jackets and the stuff that they wore when they used to work in the plant like that. But um, I, of course, that's protective gear, obviously, that he's wearing on the left. Um, that's a furnace coat. What's you that called? That at the blast furnace. What is it called, Bruce? A furnace coat. A furnace coat. Okay. Well, that it thing. Is, uh, it is uh, insulated and it is a, a silver in color. I'm not sure if it's uh, an aluminum alloy or or some other kind of uh, right. protect. Uh, and, and I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's a heat and spark shield is what it is. Okay. A full jacket. Right. Incredible, incredible. But then you get to the next set of photos here, and I had to put these two together. You know, I love curating this work from you great photographers out there because it gives me a chance to go back to my roots of being a photo editor at the Times and doing these types of combos and things. This is just perfect. You have the guy on the left uh, with his with his uh, blasting helmet, not blasting helmet, with his welding helmet. And then you have uh, the gentleman on the right. Uh, I trying to read the inscription on the helmet um it says it's hard to read but you have the gentleman on the right he's he's wearing all his all his all his uh, indian and other jewelry and stuff uh, well, everybody you know, i mean he was joe that joe the hat wilfinger on the right joe the hat wilfinger wilfinger right bruce <laughs> steven the great thing about stefan the great thing about the these shots are when i see these people I worked with these guys for 20, 30 years. Right, right. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. Not only, uh, you know, can I relate to their look, uh, right. but it's like all these memories we had, you know. Oh, I mean, and they, these two guys, I mean, all of them, but these two guys in particular look so amazing. I would love to sit down at a bar and just have a drink with them and talk with them for hours, you know. Well, the, guy, the guy on the left, Les Clore, he was actually uh, a member of the Green Berets. Wow. Wow. And uh, Indian Joe, Joe the Hat Wilfinger, he had Indian blood in him. And uh, uh, he, uh, he he was a cook. He, he would, uh, he, you know, in the carpenter shop when uh, the holidays would come, you'd bring your food in. Joe would organize who brought what. And then he would uh, do his work early in the morning and then, you know, an hour before lunchtime, he would be in the shanty getting everybody's lunch ready. And wow, yeah. So I love I love these portraits. They are so gorgeous. Um, and you know, Edward, you you did beautiful portraits here, man. One thing that's very important about this, and it's good for the viewers to know this. And when we were talking to them and interviewing them, you know, there's a comfort zone. They they were they felt very much at home with us. And a lot of, uh, you know, we would start talking about um, of memories. You know, Bruce would bring things up, and they, they, would, they would relax. They would become themselves. So it isn't really like, well, okay, you know, we're just taking this portrait like it's a, like a school 
uh, oh. portrait. No, it's not like that. This is this is the real thing. This is well to be authentic to, as to who well, they are. And, yeah, and that's the thing, you know, the one thing that I've always talked about on this show with many photographers and everything is, you know, when you when you are when you for many photographers, you guys, I mean, Bruce, you work there. Edward, you grew up in the area and you've you've really know a lot about the story. Most photographers, when they walk into a scene, it takes them a little time. Some of them have it get it instantly because they just have that magic about them. Some photographers where you get close to your subjects, you become a fly on the wall and uh, you get that closeness and therefore you get those beautiful moments because the trust is there, the feeling is there, the camaraderie is there that develops really quick sometimes and sometimes it takes longer. With you guys, it's different. You've been around these people a lot and you see it in these photos. I absolutely adore these portraits. Boy, thank you. I absolutely adore them. Uh, they take me right in there with them, and I want to get to know these great steel workers really fast. So mm -hmm. let's let's go through a few more here. And here's Mr. Check, uh, as as he was in the story by CBS News, standing there. Um, um, you know, unfortunately, you told me he did pass away. Correct, Edward? Edward? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. he was yeah. uh, eighty. Four, I believe, and right. uh, I worked with Richie for many years. He was my A man, uh, yeah. and uh, the things I learned from Richie go way beyond what uh, what you learn in a work environment. I mean, these guys, uh, day in, day out, any kind of weather conditions, any kind of uh, working conditions, they were there at the plant. And uh, when you when you spend that much time in that kind of an environment. You, you know, you become so knowledgeable of it and you become uh, not not to say an expert, but you become the person who is going to keep the next generation alive. Right. No, don't don't touch that. Don't work over there. No, bring that over here. No, you need to be over there. Now, watch yourself here. Right. And he talked about when he was just starting in the plant, how the guys did that to him. The older guys, because they were the hallmarks of safety, because right. they knew what could happen. And some of the stories uh, I could tell you about Richie firsthand uh, are amazing. He he was just an amazing person. He knew how to do everything, and he was so emotional when he when he would tell the stories. He would be he would be in tears. You know, he would really uh, he was this he was like. The biggest uh, voice that, well, certainly the Steelworkers Archives had, uh, um, but this, this, just the Steelworker community itself. And when he would tell a story, his voice would echo, like it would, it would have a resonance to it, and, and it, it, it was unbelievable. Right, Bruce? I mean, yeah, he, he, was, a, a, he was a natural storyteller, he really was. He certainly it's this, you know, uh, I'm so glad that, uh, Edward, you had posted that clip from CBS News of Mr. Check. Uh, is it Cheek or Check? I'm sorry. Check. 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 Mr. Check, because I have to tell you, he, he, he captured my heart in that clip, man. He really did. Because my grandfather for years uh, um, uh, was an engineer and then he, he, um, he did other work as a, as a taxi cab driver in New York. But regardless of the work, I'm just saying that, you know, there, there's something about the old timers that just bring you back the stories, the history, of course, the hard work that was always put in. We live in a different world now, but we need to remember the the immigrants that are here now and many from the past, including right now, uh, all these frontline workers that are doing all this essential work right now make me think of the incredible hard work that's being put in right now just to survive this pandemic. By mm -hmm. so many, by so many people, I'm just drawing a correlation here between mm -hmm. hard work on all ends, and I want people to always remember that that where this country was built by many, many people, including these steel workers and including these immigrants now who are delivering food every day while everybody else is sitting home waiting for the food, and they're risking their lives with COVID and everything else. So we need to, be, you know. Stephen, every generation has its tests, and in exactly. that. We're all connected in some way. Exactly. And you, you, you guys you guys documented such an incredible 
part of this. Look at look at the look at this photo. I mean, wow. Um, I, I could stand here, sit here, and look at these faces for hours, and and try to think about what they may have been thinking at this moment. You know. Um, just, just beautiful. Let's, let's roll through some more. So this is interesting. Um, we, we, you know, let's give just a quick little brief, um, moment. You talked about it earlier, but now that we're at this point, just a brief moment about the contrast between this historic photo here and then how it was quick, how it was made into a play. Just give us a summary of this, please. This is a, a festival unbound. Uh, this was performed in 2019. Uh, this was, they performed it inside of the Charter Arts High School in Bethlehem. Uh, uh, and um, this is the, this is the um, successor to Steelbound. You know, this, this was the community's uh, uh, way of um, asking, okay, it's, it's been so many years since, uh, since everything closed and we've been through so much. Uh, where are we going to go now? You know, and, um, one of the things that they wanted to do, obviously, they wanted to remember again the sacrifices and and, and these contributions of of all these people, and yet they and the, the idea was to concentrate also on the young people, you know how how they're going to remember everything, and then and then create a new uh, uh, have have the community be reborn, and how how all these different ethnic groups and and religions and in this melting pot, you know, how, how are we going to forge ahead? Right. And, uh, this is such a, such a powerful photo from the production that you shot because, yeah. you know, I remember you speaking about this guy sitting on, uh, standing on top of one of the structures that sort of like a Christ-like stance yes. with, with those chains coming down, holding him up and the other workers around him it must've been a very powerful play. It was extremely powerful. And, you know, if you look at the bottom right-hand side, you see that pile? That was a tribute pile. Mm. They were taking artifacts mm-hmm. and putting them in this pile as a remembrance. And it's like almost like an offering type of thing. Bruce, you remember. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, um, really, really just incredible. So here's Bruce, everybody. So Bruce, take us through a few of these photos that I'm going to show um, while we while we go through them. Uh, here's you, obviously, at the plant. Uh, this is after after it's been closed down, obviously, uh, with your camera and everything. But tell us about your journey into the plant after working there for so many years to take more pictures. It was kind of surreal because... Um, while I was there, I really didn't want to have anything to do with the plant. I, I mm. just get me out of there. It was mm. just a horrific place to work. Mm. Uh, and then uh, when I got laid off, I went to school for radio and TV. Oh, and okay. after I graduated, I figured, what am I going to do with this education? I mean, so I started talking to the people I used to work with. I said, do you want to... Uh, you want to be interviewed? And uh, most of them said, no, I have nothing to say. It was too soon after the plan had closed. Mm-hmm. So uh, in about uh, 1998, when they started getting ready to do Steelbound, I I got a couple of people to say yes. So, uh, and, and that's, of course, when and where I met Ed. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the image before, now this is during the plant's operation. These two guys are getting ready to change the skip tub, which takes the raw material from below grade up to the top of the furnace wow. to get dumped into the furnace wow. to, be, uh, to be made into iron. Wow. This so, is such a, this is such, you know, wow. I, I, Look, looking at these two guys with their, um, with their, I don't know, would you call them hot suits? <laughs> no, no, no. They're it's cold. They're where it's cold outside. Those are car hearts, probably. No, I mean car uh, suits to keep them hot. I didn't mean hot suits. To, I meant I meant in terms of keeping them warm and everything. Yeah. Because yeah, that that's the industrial car heart stuff. I know that stuff well. I had a friend who worked on the tracks of uh, in the in subways for years, and uh, car heart is the brand of choice. <laughs> yeah, it um, is. But, but the what a great photo, by the way, Bruce. Actually, Thanks. unbelievable photo. Um, I love this because you had. I always tell people do panos uh, of certain structures and and uh, and sites because you get the whole 
the whole, you know, uh, scope, the whole scope, well, you know? These pictures, Stefan, they they come from the part of the series that uh, I had a pocket Instamatic camera that I took with me. You weren't allowed to take pictures in the plant. Right, and right. if I would have got caught, I would have got fired and my camera would have been taken, plus the sure. film. Wow. But uh, it was uh, – in the uh, mid late eighties and the plant was starting to uh, go down. I mean, severely go down. Yeah. Started in 73, there were 13,500 people there by the mid eighties. There were maybe 4,500 people there. Right. So you could see these reductions in people. And I thought, you know what, if, if I don't take some pictures of some of this stuff, it's not going to be here, nor will the people well, that's the thing that you guys have done is you preserved history here, and uh, we're very thankful for it. Um, I want to uh, go through some of these other historic photos here that you guys provided me with to show our viewers and to be part of this segment that we're doing tonight because it really then brings everything full circle. So let me show some of these um, and, and you know, I mean, look at the workers with the stogie and everything, and they're getting, you know, they're they're tightening up some equipment there. But but these photos here of the actual uh, steel, the uh, uh, being poured, and this photo is is <laughs> I look I look at it and. And the first thing that grabs me is the guy holding his helmet by his heart and the other guy sticking his head out the window as if, please take my picture so I can be <laughs> a part of it. So I can be a part of history. You know, it, th- this is American history, man. Look at this photo, man. I mean, it's something out of it, it's all of these photos. I just pray are going to be not just in the archives of uh, tell me the place. There's two places they're in the archives of. Well, the, uh, these are from the collection of the Steelworkers archives. Okay. And, I, uh, I just pray that they're going to end up in some major museums, too. Not that those aren't important, but I also hope that they end up in some major museums. Now, with that, and then, some, go ahead, Bruce. Some, some of the stuff is also in the National Museum of Industrial History. Okay. okay. And you, we also have the uh, Historic Bethlehem Association. Right, and uh, we also have uh, Lehigh University has quite an archive. Great, great. Because Steel, look, look, look at this. Look at this photo, folks. I mean, could you imagine walking through this on that on that on that uh, level there? with that steel and everything uh, with the. Um, I'm sorry, Bruce. Give me the proper technical term. Well, they're they're making steel from iron at that point. Okay, look at that. I mean, the heat alone, Bruce. How how hot was it down there? I mean, it was so hot <laughs> when you left the steel company in the summertime. The whole world was air conditioned. So let me ask you a question, Bruce. Are you a winter guy or a summer guy after working in here for all those years? <laughs> I, I don't do winters anymore. It's just much, much, much too brutal. I worked outside for. Uh, 28 years, and that was oh, just man. too much for me. Yeah, I no, mean, I know, I know. I'm sure. Not only did I work outside, you know, when we were looking at all those shots of the blast furnaces, right? I was at the top of every single one of them. Wow, wow! And uh, it's like um, it, it, you can do it while you're young, and then, of course, when I talked about Richie Check and how. The old timers told him, and then he told me, and then I was supposed to tell the next generation coming up. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. there was no next generation, so right. you know we didn't have anybody to help carry our our uh, our torches and our uh, materials for to do a job. We had to we had to do everything. No, you and, guys, you guys were I, I I'll say it straight. You guys, no, no pun intended at all. No pun here. It's straight fact. You guys were Iron Man. Well, thank you. <laughs> no, you were Iron Man. I mean, this is t- uh, the m- toughest of the tough work. I mean, but yet, let's get to just a moment here uh, because we have about 15 minutes. 
Um, I want to, uh, 10 to 15 minutes left. I want to talk about just for a brief moment here, the precision, because, you know, you look at all, uh, Edward touched on this earlier. Uh, you look at the, the, the structures, how big they are. You look at the stuff that was built to pour this stuff, to mold it, to do all that stuff that built America. And then you look at these photos and you have to realize, right, Edward, the precision that went into all this. Yeah. And then you think about the scale of it too. I mean, the number two machine shop, right? Right, Bruce. And like all those places, you have these uh, like like huge lathes, but everything had to be done exactly. You know, some of these things were 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 parts for nuclear power plants. I mean, you can't mess around. You know? Right. I mean, you're, you're looking at a boring machine that's going to bore anywhere from ninety nine to one hundred and twenty inches. Wow. Wow. Twelve feet. You're boring a hole in a piece of metal. 12 feet diameter. But let's also remember, and I wanted to just show this real quick, that 270 tons of Bethlehem steel back in the days were used to to build the moon rocket transporters. Look at that moon rocket transporter, folks. These iron men help make sure that we got to space and uh, we had liftoffs and everything else by creating these structures that transported the rockets to the launch pads and everything. And look at look at this. I mean, amazing, amazing. Absolutely well, amazing. When I first started there, uh, I was just so amazed when you would go through the machine shops and you would go through the, uh, uh, the treatment facilities, right. and then you would hear and read history and – uh, documentation on uh, all of the uh, naval vessels and arms right. that came out of Bethlehem Steel Corporation. Right. I mean, there were three or four shipyards. There were wow. uh, I don't know how many plants, and and they just they would pump out. They would they would they would set a keel for a ship in four days. Wow. Set the keel. Oh and then God. after that keel was set, it would take, uh, you know, 30, 40 days, 50 days to get that ship completed. But they were pushing out a ship a day for a thousand days. A ship a day. Look, folks, did you hear that? A ship a day for a thousand days. That is yeah. absolutely an amazing amount of work. Um, Bruce, how many people worked in the plan at one point? Well, like I said, Steph, and I started in 73, there were 13,500. But during the war, wow. uh, I'm talking uh, probably uh, 39 to uh, 48, I would say, uh, you had uh, 25 or 30,000 people working there at just what the were, what were the, uh, what were, Sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to ask this before I forget. What, what, what were the shifts? Uh, the shifts varied uh, a, a few. Uh, minutes in some cases they were uh, seven to three day shift, three to eleven middle shift, and eleven to seven day shift. But if there was a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a huge shop that had a big turnover, mm. they would stagger those shifts by fifteen minutes, sometimes a half an hour, right? So that you had your men still working on the floor as the new people were coming in, wow. so that you could keep the communication viable. Well, we have to remember also that bridges were built with this stuff. I love this, Edward, a magnificent photo. I love the way you capture bridges and roads. Uh, here's some classic work by Edward of uh, some of the rail lines that used to run through the area here. And you can see how old they are. They're breaking apart now. But look at these beautiful photos and Edward's touch with the incredible black and white uh, work and everything else. Edward, these are magnificent, um, especially this one. This one is just stunning. Yeah, and you think of all those. I mean, it's very likely that that steel came from the Bethlehem plant. Yeah, you know, we are yeah. looking at things from a certain era, right? You know, that's uh, that's what we see. And, and Bruce, yeah. I remember I was telling uh, Stefan about this. You know, you guys would look for marks on the beams to to see where oh, yeah. you, know, you wanted to find information about that, and you're very proud of that, right? Yeah, yeah. whenever you go on a vacation, uh, didn't matter where it was, if it was the ocean or if it was, you know. Uh, right. uh, North or south, and any big building that you would go into, you would see if you could find a, a, a bare section of beam and see if it came from the Bethlehem plant. I hear that, man. I hear that. It's just unbelievable, you know. But um, Bruce, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on the show. 
I wanted to say thank you for what you did for our country, helping to build it and everything. And I hope your knee gets better. I know it's been hard on you lately. You've been a real trooper to come here tonight with your knee up, probably up on a chair and moving upstairs for better lighting for us for the spinach yeah. social hour. Um, you know, thank you. Thank you for maneuvering around your, around your house today for this and being here. Um, it's been an honor, Stefan. I, I appreciate you having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. You take care of yourself. Okay. All right. Very okay. good. Thank, thank you. you Bruce. Okay. Stay around. Stay around though. Okay. Okay. We'll I was gonna okay. I was gonna take leave, but if you want me to stick around yes. for a couple of minutes, I'm still here. Stick around. We're gonna do a little photo afterwards so we have one together. Uh, I'll be All right. right. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. So Edward, I wanted to roll through a few of these as we uh as we need to close out soon, but I wanted to uh more we're not closing out any in any time in the next few minutes, but I wanted to go over these because there's something iconic that you captured here. There's something um, that that just is universal. I mean, you look at this photo and you went to the Vietnam War Memorial and tell us the history behind this photo. Well, this was in the mid 1990s. I took this about 1994. I took this image. And um, of all things, I was going down to Washington, D.C. I was, there were some political activities I was interested in, you know, having that being a political science major. Sure. And um, after I was done with that, um, you know, I, of course, I had my camera. And at the time uh, that I, I had a medium format six by nine Fuji GSW 690, uh, which they call the Texas Leicas. You know? And uh, I had a, a Pentex six. I had a Pentex digital spot meter, same meter that Ansel Adams used. And you know, I had an, I, I had this image in my mind. I, I, like I'm going to get an image of the wall, but you know, you're not really sure exactly how that's going to happen. And in, in, when this happened, um, the first thing that I did, I, I noticed the sky. I said, "My God, this is really incredible." And what I did is I, I, uh, I was shooting a T-Max 400 and I wasn't, I didn't care if I overexposed the sky. It's not digital. Right? I didn't even know, you knew what that was back then. Right. right. And uh, I, 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 I metered towards the darkest area of the wall because I wanted to get all the detail. And the only, the only thing I had to wait for was the right moment when somebody would touch it because everybody's touching it. And it happened. It was, a, it was a very short period of time and boom, and uh, and and there it is, you know. I, but every every it was part of that uh, pre visualization process. It, it started to take shape, and then you, you have that very small period in time where where it's almost we're in the zone, you know. It, yeah. It, when the magic happens. Yeah, no, it's when the magic happens. And you captured it beautifully. But, you know, the thing that, uh, so Mark Lee here says that um, he has, uh, actually, we have to interrupt for a second because Mark's a big fan of this show, too, and always a great supporter of every show on the air. Uh, hmm. Not every show, but a lot of shows. Does Ed have any relatives in North Carolina? I know a friend of mine, Shannon Leskin, and her husband. Right. Wonder if they are related. She is in the arts education field. <laughs> Interesting. I'd have to do some research. If, if we are, it's great. It's a less uh, lonely place in the world, right? Well, Mark, Mark may have found you some relatives there. Mark is a great, great. He he is a very knowledgeable writer and podcaster and many things. Everybody should look up Mark Lee online and find his shows. Uh, he says he loves the work of Ansel Adams and everything. But, you know, the important thing here that I want to get to real, uh, not quick, but I want to touch on as we close out soon is this amazing image has been adopted and, uh, taken, uh, taken a life of its own with the yeah. Vietnam war Memorial fund. Tell us, Edward, tell well, us about that. It's, I, uh, it's one of these things where you develop it, you look at your work and then, and then you put it away. And, mm -hmm. And I went to a bookstore and I was looking at these images of, of the wall. I said, you know, something I mean, I, I think I might have something that's really interesting because we always compare things with other artists. You know, I, I thought, you know, maybe maybe I do have something special. So what I did is I uh, I called the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund up and I said, you know, I, th I think I have some images. Could I, could I please send them to you? And they say, sure. And in about three days, I got this phone call Um and uh, their special events coordinator called me up. Uh, uh, her name was Libby Hatch. Unfortunately, she's not alive anymore, but oh. she was a great woman. Um, and uh, she um, she said, can we please, 
please use this image. Wow. And I said, the only thing you got to do is put, you know, just, um, just put my name on it, credit it. And I want to help veterans any way that I can. Of course. And, of course. And, and they, you know, it was like, you know, it was like a mutual respect and, and, you know, it, it, it really touched me. Well, and, I think it's, I think it's really, really important to contribute to a, well, something so important, but of yeah. course, you know, your credit needs to be on there. I mean, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, but, but even the ability to give something back to society and affect people, I had this thing on display at this art fair. It was in Allentown and a, and a veteran came up to me, a Vietnam veteran and, he fell in love with the image and uh, you know, I was able, I gave him one of the pictures and he asked me, uh, would you like, we became friendly and he said, would you like to go down with me to the wall? And I said, I'd be honored. And then he, and then when we were going down, he said, this is the first time that I ever went and I needed somebody with me to support me. Mm. Well, they also, so they also made a coin of the picture. Uh, uh, one of your uh, friends, I believe, uh, is it Zampe? Oh, yeah. It was the 25th anniversary. Okay, okay. It was minted into a coin, and uh, you know, lo- I made the press. Uh, you know, right. lo- it was in the, it was in the paper, and you know, it was like wow. an honor. But I mean, wow, what an honor! What an honor! But you've been there. You've documented some of the uh, some of the uh, visitors down there and everything. But what I want to you know what I want to switch to for a minute too is you know I I want to tell you this personally, having curated and gone through all this work that you submitted to me for the show, uh, was such a thrill. Um, but also it got my juices flowing thinking about what I'd love to see you do more of. I'd love to see you do a lot of work too on these, uh, classic air shows and, and Americana stuff. You capture Americana really beautifully. And I have to tell you, this is a, I'm going to just go through these because we need to, but these photos that I'm going to show right here are absolutely amazing. This is wild. And you know, look at these beautiful images that uh, Edward Leskin has taken uh, and some of the reenactments at some of these shows. That's Just the World, World War II weekend at, in Reading, Pennsylvania. It's, it happens once a year. And okay. With COVID-19, unfortunately, a lot mm-hmm. of things canceled and delayed. But, you know, that's something that's something to go to. It's it's very very interesting it wow this is just this is this is a magnificent picture man (laughs) thank you i i look at it and i'm just like how did he do that i mean that is amazing you captured that perfect moment where you were obviously this is on the ground and then yet those fighter uh pilots uh the uh, air show is uh doing its thing the uh, pilots in the air and you got that perfect burst when they were doing this sort of simulation of you know, going in different directions, the way these air shows, uh, you know, uh, do these things sometimes. This is just magnificent, absolutely gorgeous photo. And uh, um, wow, the the contrast between the uh, the silver and the clouds in this one, yeah. um, and this B is that a, a um, um, what kind of plane is that? B twenty nine, super B twenty nine. Okay. Wow, look at that, man. I mean, oh, man, that's a beast. Um, But, you know, let's close out on a on a on a happy note. Those are beautiful, happy photos, too, in terms of the the beauty of them. Um, But let's let's end up on a happy note here with an incredible photo that you took of your daughter once. And I want to close it out here on this photo uh, because we're at that time limit. But what a what an absolutely stunning photo to have of your daughter with this beautiful beluga. Uh, I'm sorry, porpoise, right? Yes, it's a bottlenose dolphin. Bottlenose dolphin, and man, what a what a! I, I hope you have this on your wall because I could look at it for days. <laughs> yeah, that was a special thing, you know. And it, I only I, I I was at the time it was the first Leica digital that came out. That I, I had a Leica M8 and a 35 f2 Summicron. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you had, I kind of saw it coming. It's like this anticipation that you're, uh, that you're going to see something, uh, appear and then it happens, you know, and, and the way that the, 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 you have a human being and you have an animal on there, they're communicating with each other on, on a level that, that's incredible to me. And, yeah. and, and the fact that it was my daughter you know, it makes it even, 
it makes it even more special. It's you you captured some moment there, man. That is a that is a father's dream to capture a photo like that. Um, I have to give it to you. Hats off. But you know, Edward, I have to tell you, man. Um, it's been an absolute, you know, pleasure to have you on here um, to, you know, to show all your work, to talk about this history with Bruce. For a quick second here, it's been a, a show where uh, I didn't have time to do this, but I wanted to quickly bring on our great co-producer, Jonathan Borstein, who's a tremendous help to me every time I put this show together, uh, who's a dear friend and uh, puts up with all my quirks in putting this show together. Um, and cracks the whip when I need it to be cracked. <laughs> Jonathan, introduce yourself, please. Uh, Jonathan Borstein. I am a um, full-time flaneur, uh, part-time tech, sometime writer. And I do have one question for Go for it. You, which is, you've been a, a loyal member of our audience for Upteen shows, and now you've seen the other side of the show. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I uh, well, for it, it's very stimulating to me. I, I, I like the dialogue. You know, it, it goes back to the ancient Greek traditions of, uh, of of speech, and you know, I mean, just just to have to have an interaction um, with my work. You know, I mean, I, it's it's energizing to me. I mean, it's thrilling, I'm, I'm, and I'm I'm very honored. You know, and you know, one thing I was talking to Stefan about this. You know, COVID nineteen brought us all together because mm-hmm. I remember. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I was commenting on Peter Turnley's work, lovely work, and uh, and Stefan uh, friend requested me. That's how I found I found out about this, and, and of course I wanted to say something because you know we want to, even though everything's closed down and everything, we want to be part of something, something that's bigger than ourselves, and we want to give something uh, to humanity. And you know that's that's the wow. true essence of what you guys are doing, and you know it's it's an incredible. Uh, uh, honor to be to be associated with it. I mean, it, it, I, I get a chill up my spine. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Well, you've been like Jonathan said. You've been one of our biggest supporters, if not the biggest. And we appreciate your viewership. We appreciate your friendship, and now we appreciate you sharing your incredible work with us. So, um, one of the things I quickly want to do, just stay on, is I want to mention our sponsor. I should have done this earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt the importance of this show at that moment. I'm sure they'll understand. And then I just want to give a quick shout out to a colleague, and then I'll be right back, and we're going to close it out, folks. The great Edward Leskin. Uh, keep in touch with him uh, on Facebook. Find him if you ever want to be able to show his work in a certain exhibit if he's willing to uh, to work with you guys on something. He's a great guy, great photographer. And uh, Edward, hold on, we'll be right back. I'm going to intro this uh, quick uh, um, video uh, from our sponsor, StreamYard, who I'm always proud to have this show broadcast through. Greatest platform on earth, in my opinion. Here we go. All right. The other thing I want to do, folks, is I want to give a quick shout out, a uh, real quick shout out to Sri Srinivasan, my dear colleague and dear friend, uh, for his Sunday NYT read along this Sunday, February 7th at 8.30 a.m. Join Sri and the uh, NYT read along family and the A-team, as I call them, uh, with Neil Parekh, the producer uh, and VP of DigiMentors. Uh, uh, Sri and Neil do incredible work with Digi Mentors, who I consult with, I work with, and we do a lot of things together on uh, three Sunday Sunday NYT read along this week with an ex colleague of mine and one of the most famous sports writers in history, George Vesey. Please join him. It's Super Bowl Sunday. There's no better time to be on the Sunday NYT read along than with George Vesey and Sri. This is going to be a classic one, folks. Tune in. We've got a classic matchup coming in this week between Brady and, and Mahomes. I'm looking forward to that one, everybody. So turn in for Sri Sunday NYT read along, please, on all channels and just hashtag NYT read along and you'll find it. So, folks, what an hour it's been. I have to tell you, I'm thrilled. I really enjoyed this show. Um, I loved Edward's work. Take care. Let's say goodbye, everybody, to everybody. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers. We'll be back in two Thursdays. It's every other Thursday now to Spin It Social at 9 p.m. Thank you very much. We'll be back on the 18th of February. Take care now. Bye-bye.